30 years ago, a new music burst out of New York's black and gay clubs. A soundtrack for the 70s. This new urban pop may have been created by male producers, but it was fronted by women. And what women? With what front? Let's meet the queens of disco. The queen of survival. I've had to survive a lot of personal anguish in my life, and, uh, and I've done that. The reluctant queen. I think she regretted it because it was a little too sexy. The warrior queen. If it wasn't for disco, I wouldn't be sitting here. The gay queen. The so Sylvester thought you were a woman. The fiery queen. I couldn't be in the background, I had to be in front. and the queen of reinvention. She knew she was gonna be a big star, but the rest of the world just didn't know it. It was the 1970s, the Please Me decade. Party time with a brand new soundtrack. People were just burning the candle at both ends. People thought the party would never stop, the music would never stop, the record never stops. And so it was a non-stop, non-stop party. Everyone wanted to be happy, and that dancing was good, made you happy. It certainly was the time to shout out who you are and what you are and what you wanted to be. So every disco, we'd all be up on the dance floor and we danced around the handbags. We are family. Women's Lib was gaining ground among black women. They could sing sexier songs than men could sing. No, there was no sampling in those days, no computers. It was the real deal. So you actually had to be a great singer. A lot of divas were born out of disco. After the struggles of the 60s, gay men in New York felt free to come out and party for the first time. I just remember getting up on the dance floor and basically just showing off. There is an affinity between out gay men and successful black women because we've had to swim upstream of the same stereotypes most of our life and had the same enemies and the same joys. We are it was a new world with new stars. Step forward our first queen, Disco's Great Survivor. New York, September 2005. And our first queen of disco is about to be inducted into the Dance Music Hall of Fame. This is Gloria Gaynor, the woman who gave disco its greatest anthem. But I Will Survive also sums up the life of the woman who sings it. Gloria Fowles, as she then was, was born in New Jersey in 1947. Her mom, Queenie May, had to bring up all seven children on her own after their father left before Gloria was even born. It was a poor but religious family, and young Gloria started singing in the church choir. I actually feel that it was a divine appointment that God looked down on me and said, Gloria, you have to sing. Almost all black female singers of the generation sang in church. There's a certain kind of feeling that you get from gospel music. When you praise God, um, there's a feeling that you bring that energy in. Gloria was very close to her mother, so she was devastated when Queenie died. She turned to the church for comfort. God has been there for her. He's been her strength. Uh, as she coped with all of the difficulties in her life, I'm pretty sure um, she's able to cope through her faith. 
Now, Gloria also had to earn a living. So she used what she saw as her God-given talent, working as a session singer and on the cabaret circuit. Her reputation grew, and in the early 70s, she was signed by major label MGM. They teamed her up with a producer who was looking for a great voice to go with a new idea. Something that sounded like it cost a million dollars to make. Tom Moulton had worked as a club DJ. Now that discotheques were springing up everywhere, Tom knew what clubbers wanted. In 1974, Never Can Say Goodbye became the first extended mix record. The things that people who were going to these clubs wanting to hear were tracks that went on for eight minutes or ten minutes because when you had something like that, you could really lose yourself in the music. All the DJs seemed to jump on it. That sort of created a phenomenon. But Gloria herself had reservations about this new way of doing things. My ego was tapped because it seemed to me that he only used the music to elongate the record instead of using more of my vocal. She listened to the whole thing and she said, I don't sing much. Gloria apparently turned around to Tom and said, well, what do I do <laughs> when we're performing this record? And Tom says, well, I guess you have to start dancing a little too. But the formula worked. Never Can Say Goodbye was the first disco record to cross over into the pop charts. America's disco DJs crowned Gloria the first official queen of disco. She was riding high. Then, in 1978, disaster struck. I fell, back was over a monitor. I'd ruptured a disc in that fall. Woke up the next morning paralyzed from the waist down. She needed emergency surgery on her spine. Doctors told her she might never walk again, and she spent the next four months in hospital. People around in the business were thinking that I was finished, saying that the queen is dead and things like that was probably the lowest ebb in my career because I, I never expected that. I expected that they would support me. Meanwhile, songwriter Dino Vaccaris was working with producer Freddie Perrin on a new song. I had no idea who was going to sing it, except that I remember telling Freddie, the next diva that comes our way, this is the tune we're going to do on her. Ill as she was, as soon as she read the lyrics, Gloria knew it was the song for her. I've had to survive a lot of personal anguish in my life. My mother passed away, my sister passed away, my brothers, two of my brothers passed away from cancer and, and different, my sister was murdered. The next thing I did was I Will Survive. And I suppose that all of that helped me to sing I Will Survive with great conviction. Even in this famous video, Gloria's back is still in a brace. And I grew strong, and I learned how to get along and throw your back. And after recording it, she went straight back into hospital. She was convinced the song should be a hit, but the record company had other ideas. I Will Survive was put by the record company on the B side of the record. It wasn't considered strong enough for the release. Could have gotten lost, but somebody decided to listen to that B side in New York and uh, flipped the record, and it took off. People liked it, people loved it. The company didn't believe in it, but Gloria did. You put, I'll survive on, and that sort of, I don't know, it always up, uplifts you, really. Gay men particularly took it as a, just an anthem for the community as a whole. Women's liberation was kind of surfacing, and that was like a, a proclamation to all women. My three kids go, oh, your song's on, Mum, <laughs> you know. Uh, sorry, Gloria, I know it's yours as well, but... No matter what happens in my life and to me, I will overcome it, I will survive, and to be able to get out on a dance floor and say, here I am, this is me, no matter what has gone on in my life, I'm here. I will fight for who I am. I think it's an anthem for everyone. I will survive. The song celebrates the tenacity of the human spirit. That's anybody, anywhere. I can't tell you what a blessing this song has been to me. I Will Survive has taken on a life of its own. It's been re-released countless times and covered by over 200 different artists. 
Gloria continues to perform around the world, but none of her later records ever topped I Will Survive. Will you survive? Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Today, she's gone back to her gospel roots, but she does pop out to collect the odd award. You can't really separate the success of my career from I Will Survive. But the way that I Will Survive has been able to stand the test of time and carry my career. To accept the award for I Will Survive. I don't feel cheated. I don't feel at a loss. It would have been nice. Miss Gloria Gaynor! But it's wonderful to have this song. Thank you so much, all of you. Oh, yes, okay. New York was the birthplace of disco in the 1970s. It was the city every would-be queen of disco wanted to conquer. The underground club scene was thriving. You grew up riding the subways. Even though the city had fallen on hard times. Up in Harlem. New York was always a tough place. Every block was taken over by drug dealer. You're the heart and soul of New York City. We had police strikes, we had garbage strikes. On every level, the city was really being challenged. And that challenge led to a lot of need for freedom and for self-expression. There was, without a doubt, a buzz on the streets of New York. It was alive. There was this very heady sense of possibility that you really could just uh, reinvent yourself and, and be anything and do anything and do it all night long. And disco brought everyone together. So you had this real interesting, very New York kind of mix of, of black and gay dance aesthetics all mixing together. The old theme was about the endless partying. Our next queen also came from a gospel background to create a succession of sexy secular anthems. It was racy, making love to the microphone, it's all going off. But was she too sexy for her own good? She kind of regretted it because it was a little too sexy. When Donna Summer was born again Christian and yet she made her fame singing a song that was basically her simulating an orgasm. Enter the reluctant queen. to call the righteous uh. Like Gloria Gaynor, the young Donna Summer was born into a deeply religious community, this time in Boston in 1948. She also sang in a church as a child and believed her voice was a gift from God. But when Donna was 16, the close-knit community was rocked by a murder. She's the only eyewitness. The police show up and they force her to testify. And she begins to get these death threats. And she freaks out. Donna fled to New York. It was 1968, the summer of love. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. After growing up in this restricted Christian neighborhood, she suddenly thrust alone into the world of hippy-dippy New York City, and she is ecstatic. I mean, she feels free for the first time in her life. Donna auditioned for a new European production of the risque musical Hair. She was successful and spent the next seven years in Germany. There, she teamed up with a producer who was to revolutionize the sound of disco with his synthesizer. Love to Love You Baby started as a little bit of a joke. She came up with the title Love to Love You Baby and she said, why don't we do a song? I threw everybody out, uh, dimmed the light so she couldn't see me and I could barely see her and that's when she did it. To be honest, I don't think she really thought about it. She just did it and we did it in probably 15, 20 minutes. She never intended for that recording to be released to the public. Once it's recorded, it's there forever. It was 1975. 
Giorgio sent the recording to Casablanca, a young record company with a reputation for signing wild, sexy acts. The phone rings. Congratulations, you've got the number one hit record in America. What record is that, she said. Love to Love You, Baby. And she just dissolves into a, a combination of joy and fear. At the very beginning, when the record came out, she was all happy, of course, because it was a big hit. But later on, I think she kind of regretted it because it was a little too sexy. She hated touring. Basically, her act was 20 minutes of Love to Love You, Baby. It became a breakthrough hit. The DJs love it because, in a sense, this kind of orgasmic symphony is exactly what's happening on the dance floor. I says, uh-oh, here it comes. Sex and disco. <laughs> in those days, it was racy. My granddad would say, stop playing that devil music. It's quite poor now, her voice. In some ways, it makes you understand why she found God, because she was like a, you know, like a porno actress, really. Donna was a star, but off stage, she was becoming more and more depressed by her fame and the lifestyle that went with it. One night in 1976, she reached rock bottom. She becomes a huge star and then tries to kill herself. She's in this hotel room and she feels that she's depressed. She goes to the window and decides to jump to her death. And she's about to go over when the maid comes in and says, oh, you know, Miss Summer, what are you doing? What's the matter? And the maid kind of snaps her back to reality. And that becomes the basis of Donna's own resurrection. Donna later said she felt that God had intervened to save her and wanted her to carry on singing. Casablanca sent her back into the studio with Marauder. On I Feel Love, it started with a, a bass line, dun, 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 dun. then the chords came in. The only thing left uh, human, kind of, is the voice. My coming out song was I Feel Love. I remember kind of going onto the dance floor and um, I just thought I'd died and gone to heaven. You know, it's like when Judy Garland woke up after the hurricane. It was that kind of feeling, you know, it was all in Technicolor all of a sudden. Casablanca began to promote her as the sexy queen of disco. And it worked. In two and a half years, she had 12 consecutive smash hits. The label had created a one-woman hit factory. Eighty percent yeah. of the disco era Donna is manufactured on records. It was all of her handlers, her stylists, telling her what to wear, telling her how to act, telling her how to arrive in a limousine. She was a little uncomfortable with it. But um, she made the most out of it. I was tired of the whole sex image because it wasn't me and it was something I was playing. It was a role, but it wasn't who I was as a person. And I always resented it, but it was the publicity and all that that the record company did just sort of pressed me into this mold. So let's dance. By now, Donna was also writing some of her songs, earning millions for herself and the record company. But by the end of the 70s, she wanted out. There was an acrimonious split with Casablanca, and she would later write a song attacking labels who treat their artists like slaves. Once she split with Casablanca, that was pretty much it for, for Donna Summer. Away from that sound, there really is no Donna Summer. Uh, she's just an, another voice, you know, in the wind. And the man and the woman fall in love. In the 80s, Donna Summer continued to write and release records, but she toned down her raunchy image, and she was more inspired by gospel music than disco. 
Then, in 1983, she hit the headlines again, this time for all the wrong reasons. Donna either volunteered or was baited into saying things in the press uh, that we interpreted as flagrantly homophobic. She was quoting her Christian fundamentalist roots, and I'm sure that's where her heart and head purely were at the time, but they were hateful. It was like a bad word on the summer. You know, they didn't want to play any of her stuff, and yeah, that was a bad time. We had loved her, worshipped her, and made her, created her, and made her very rich, and we resented the hell out of it. I think all those people have probably forgiven her by now, so, you know, and we still listen to her anyway. Donna is still performing her gospel-inspired act around the world. There's a lot of gospel singing these days. It's very much into uh, Christianity. That's a way of saying, well, I may have been bad, but I'm good now. Donna says that in her house, there isn't a single gold record displayed, which means, you know, that she doesn't consider any of that important. But the house is there because of the gold records. Our next diva was also brought up in the church, but disco allowed spirituality to mix with outrageous sexuality. So Sylvester, I thought you were a woman. What is he wearing and what is he singing? Sylvester was a gay man, but that wasn't about to stop him becoming a disco queen. After all, he already sang higher than all the girls. I really don't think there's been anybody else that's, that has made an entrance like him. Maybe Diana Ross. There was nobody like him, white or black. And, and the fact him, A, being a black man, B, being a gay black man, that, you know, it's two taboos right there. And he was able to just surpass all that and still, you know, be himself and put on one hell of a show. Sylvester James Jr. grew up in Los Angeles. His father left his mother, Letha, when Sylvester was just a baby. But like Gloria and Donna, he had a devout upbringing. The church for Sylvester was where he first got his musical training, and he brought that with him from church uh, to disco. But he was a troubled youth. When he was 15, he ran away from home and lived rough on the streets of L.A. He began to dress as a woman. Eventually, he drifted north to San Francisco. I think he was drawn to freedom and to the sense that in San Francisco, people were living out their imaginations. And that's how he always wanted to do things. He fantasized himself, and then he wanted to live that fantasy. He's gotta swim, birds gotta fly. He teamed up with a group of outrageous hippie drag artists called the Coquettes. He joined the show, impersonating female blues singers. This was um, Billie Holiday and Diana Ross on LSD. But Sylvester stood out from the group. Sylvester was probably the most talented one in the Coquettes at the time. He could get out there and sing, and everyone stopped, and it became almost serious to, to watch his performance. He was soon performing his own shows. Now he needed some backing singers. There were two white, tall females, blonde, leggy, who had just auditioned to him. And I came in and auditioned for him. And he said, OK. Uh, and he dismissed the other girls. And he asked me, he said, uh, do you know of anybody else that's as large as you are and can sing? And I said, yes. Martha Walsh and Azora Rhodes would eventually become the Weather Girls. But back then, they were known as Two Tons of Fun. It was a perfect combination. When he found them, musically, things clicked. The audience just ate it up. Having started out impersonating women singers, Sylvester was still hitting the high notes. I was the one singing at the bottom, and Azora was singing in the middle. 
and Sylvester would sing the top. My voice doesn't come anywhere near his. He could tear that falsetto soprano voice up and sing higher than quite a few females that I knew as well. He's such a gospel singer, you know, that he would just kind of like go off and um, just let his spirit soar while he's singing. <laughs> Breakthrough hit came in 1978 with You Make Me Feel. But mainstream success also brought controversy. Sylvester was openly gay. The record company per se did not have any problems with Sylvester being outrageous. But we were dealing with the reactions of people in the outside world who were in a position to make or break him. And he'd say, no, I'm going to do it this way. People want to tell him, you need to dress like this, you need to tone down that, and Sylvester could be very, very stubborn. If he felt like wearing a dress today, then he'd do that. If he felt like wearing his hair orange, then he did that. You couldn't contain him. At a time when there was no such thing as a gay celebrity, Sylvester took his outrageousness right onto Joan Rivers' primetime TV show. We performed, and she sat down to talk to him, and she asked him about his jewelry. That's you... my wedding set. That's your wedding set? All right. Who are you married to? To Rick. Uh... <laughs> and he said, Rick Kramer. And then he went, oh! Oh, God, well, you... I just, I'm sorry. No. no. What? Rick's parents are watching. Well, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> he realized that Rick's parents didn't know that Rick was gay. Didn't know Rick Kramer's parents. Now, you should have looked in your closet 10 years ago. You wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> he was who he was. And by being on a lot of talk shows in the U.S., he forced Americans to deal with it. Sylvester continued to be outrageous, especially in the wardrobe department. We loved to shop. He would call us shopping in the name of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about capes, you know, flying on stage heels. You know, he had heels on. He was not playing. First meeting, he gave me a blue sequin dress. <laughs> And I said, what's your name? He's Sylvester. I said, Sylvester? I thought you were a woman. And he was flattered. You know, he loved it, you know. Oh, girl. <laughs> and then we go uptown to the wig place and get that hair. <laughs> sure no. Jackson, what do you think about this? Look at this hat. Child, this is a bit too long. Wait a minute, can you cut it? I want to dye it. Can you dye it this color? <laughs> you know? And I'd be like, Despite his refusal to conform, in 1979, Sylvester achieved his greatest ambition. To play the staunchly conventional San Francisco Opera House. That was the ultimate deal for him, show up and do a huge show because he had made it in the world and for him to come back to San Francisco and, and let them celebrate with him. And in the audience that night was the mother he'd left behind 17 years previously. To see my son there and performing on stage was very important. It made me feel very happy. People accepted him as Sylvester. Sylvester was a star, an undoubted queen of disco. But just as things were going so well... I said, hey, baby, what's happening? He said, baby, I don't feel too good. I'm going to have a cold. I said, let me feel your forehead. He said, I don't know, you should get too close because I don't know what it is. I said, come here. He said to me, I got to go on stage in about 20 minutes. You know, come and pray with me. When I went to visit him, that's when he told me he had AIDS. And I gave him all of my support. He says, I'm going to be in the gay parade and I'm going to be in a wheelchair. And I said, really? Are you ready for that? He says, oh, yeah. So he wanted them to know. He called me the day that he demised, but he let me know he loved me. 
letting me know that he was going to be watching me no matter what. He told me, he says, Mom, I'm not going to make it. So if you could stay with me, I would appreciate it. The funeral was a big celebration. He wanted me to sing and he wanted Martha to sing. And I said, well, what do you want me to sing? He says, well, what's that song that you and Martha sing everywhere you go? <laughs> and I said, oh, touch somebody's life. He goes, please don't sing that one. <laughs> He was gonna say, please sing that one. He says, don't sing that one. And I said, okay, what do you want me to sing? So, Never Grow Old was the first song that he ever sang in church as a child. Never. In the end, he told me that he had no regrets, that he lived his life the way he wanted to live. Of all the clubs in all the world, the best disco ever was the legendary Studio 54. It was simply the best discotheque in the world. Elizabeth Taylor, Mick Jagger, everybody was there. Hey, hey. You might be standing next to a banker, you could be standing next to some gay kid up from the village, you could be dancing with God knows who, but we all felt that it was the common ground that we all yeah. stood on and uh, bumped to. Actually, uh, the most horrible thing to be standing outside, you know, and not being picked up to get in. Nobody had any fears of sex or flirting, trying everything that would come through our mouth or nose, and we just went along and had a good time all the way. It was a world where boys could be girls and girls could be boys. And Studio 54 incubated our next queen, who could look like a woman and sing like a man. Or was it the other way round? I used to go before I started singing when I was modeling and just, you know, dance, dance, dance my ass off. People really went to dance. I'm gonna do a champagne burp. Excuse me, thank you. <laughs> I can't imagine somebody that parties as hard and in such a good physical shape. She defined the glamour and androgynous style and in-your-face sexuality and unapologetic expression of who you are regardless of where you came from. Grace. Grace has become famous not just for her music, but for her wild style and unpredictability. Not hold, hold. Grace Jones is the warrior queen whose life became performance art. Grace Mendoza was born in Jamaica into a well-to-do family of politicians and preachers. Her father was a bishop and her upbringing was the strictest of all our queens. When Grace left home, she headed to New York and looked for work as a model. But she had problems being accepted for who she was. My face just was not understood. They were like, oh, but you're so dark, but your nose is, is not flat and large, and, but your lips are, are really full, and they, they just didn't they say, well, what are you? But there was one place she was appreciated, at the heart of New York's party scene, Studio 54. That's how I got discovered, jumping up on tables and singing and dancing to, to disco music. The party queen had been spotted by Island Records, who decided to put her in the studio. She jumped at the chance. She told me, I'll do whatever it takes to make it. The producer was Tom Moulton, the man who made Gloria Gaynor. But when he heard Grace, he thought she sounded like she was straight out of the movies, horror movies. And she couldn't sing, she sounded like Bela Lugosi. I am Dracula. 
mean, that's what she sounds like, you know? And I said, you know, what is wrong with you? Like other singers, Grace was expected to do as she was told. I had no control at all. I was just, you know, kind of dragged around on a leash. I had to be with, next to her with every word. I mean, it's unbelievable. I just could not believe it. And they start to clash because Tom's an ultra professional and Grace Jones probably doing her best, but she just hasn't got the best voice and she's got a whole lot of attitude that goes with it. The star, she comes down and... <coughs> and I said, Grace, we don't practice in the studio, we record. And then finally, uh, you know, maybe I should, yeah, I'll, I'll say it anyway, it doesn't matter. Finally, I got so mad and I said, Grace, with so little, you can please so many. And so they said, until you, until you apologize, she's not going to sing. So I picked up my jacket and walked out. It was a way to force them to let me have some freedom in what I was doing. Despite the bust up, a record did finally come out in 1977, aimed at the disco crowd. To promote it, Grace went to the places she knew best, New York's gay discos. Say that you will find him creeping up behind him. By now, Grace had met Jean-Paul Goud, the style editor of a men's fashion magazine. He began to transform her stage shows. Good turned Grace's shows into performance art. They were lovers, they had a child together, but he was image producer, director, so he produced a lot of the videos, a lot of the, the style. I always loved the mixture of threat and beauty. I just thought it was time for Grace to just stretch up. She came into the club on a motorcycle. She had a black hood on. She walked over to the bar. She took her arm and she knocked all the glasses off the bar. And then she proceeded to lay back on the bar, put her high heel shoe on top of the cash register and sang La Vie en Rose. One hell, hell of a show. You put her on a stage, you give her a couple cones, and she will deliver the most sensational live show you'll ever see. She was literally coming down of this huge staircase. And she was uh, dressed like a, an animal. She really is something else. A force of nature. Night clubbing. Night clubbing. I love to give carte blanche to, to artists that I respect. I think those collaborations were magical. Grace was an underground star, but she still hadn't given her label a major hit. Island boss Chris Blackwell decided to refresh her sound and teamed her up with two of his biggest reggae artists, Sly and Robbie. Chris Blackwell sent a message to us that he wanted us to see us, so I went by his apartment. So he told us about this girl. She's a Jamaican, that's what he said, and she's a disco singer. It was quite a different approach from what her disco records were. But I thought, I just felt it could really work. The breakthrough came in 1980 with the album Night Clubbing, which included the single... They brought out my roots, my Jamaicanism. And I believe that's when my voice felt the most at home. I'm very superficial. I hate everything official. She does chant over the rhythm, but the way she does it. She did grace. She you know, did it gracefully, you know, just... Grace style. Grace style, as well as say. I would my mama, baby, lead me out. Good continued to experiment. One minute Grace was white, the next she was a man. Jean-Paul's influence 
was enormous. The imagery of Grace is really what broke Grace. Feeling like a woman, looking like a man. She embodies feeling like a woman looking like a man. She has that sort of androgynous feeling about her. He's very attractive. I have seen some of the most attractive men in the world in relationship with her. Lundgren, for example, he was absolutely stunning. And he had a very, very torrid relationship with her. By now, Grace was in films, playing powerful villains who could take on any man, even James Bond. But big screen stardom wasn't what she expected. Grace had itchy feet. After doing the first uh, big film, I realized there was so much time and so much empty space. Always, you know, uh, waiting to be called and hurry up and wait. The long rounds of promotion made her even more restless. She even took it out on Russell Harty on national TV. Have you calmed yourself down? Mm, try me. <laughs> oh dear. Did you have a late night last night? No, I haven't slept in three days. I, that explains it. It's the beast in me, I don't know. It's just something in me that is impulsive. I can't look at you. Ah. <laughs> now, hold, hold, hold. Oh, hold. 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 <laughs> I just wanted some respect. <laughs> Grace wanted to go back to music, where she felt she had more control. Thank God I've got the music. Because in all that space, I was writing music. I think I would have gone crazy and I would have hated acting altogether if I didn't have the music. The music she was writing became her 1985 comeback album, Slave to the Rhythm. Grace is still a gay icon and a muse for top fashion designers. And today, she's also back in the studio with a new dance album, another disco diva who's gone back to her roots. She marches to her own beat, that's for sure. I think she's in a whole category by herself, I think. Uh, she's a queen of her own universe and, um, and we're all her subjects. <laughs> Our next queen was all woman. She could sing the hell out of anything, including disco. Chaka Khan is our fiery queen of disco. Chaka, 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 Chaka Khan. Chaka Khan. She was quite happy for her records to become part of the disco sweep of the world. But she wasn't defined by that. And I just want to enjoy singing. Chicago, Chicago, that title in town. Yvette Marie Stevens, as she was then, grew up in Chicago, a city celebrated for all kinds of music. I love it. We could go down on State Street any given night and hear, like, some of the most amazing and best and well-known old blues bands. My first influences were jazz singers, and then I branched off and never just into one kind of music. Unlike our other queens, it was popular music, not church music, that inspired her to sing. I had no training. The closest thing to any training I ever had was when I was in school, um, and I was in a choir. I was always in a, in a band or a group uh, from the time I was 13 years old. They used to call me Little Aretha. I couldn't be in the background, I had to be in front. I think maybe because I did have the best voice, too. She briefly linked up with the radical political group, the Black Panthers. We want black power. And she took an African name, Shaka, which means woman of fire. But by 72, she was back into singing with the established multiracial funk band, Rufus. Once you get started. There was nobody who had a sound like Rufus. The band was tight, but then to add to that was this woman, it seemed like she came out of nowhere, Shaka Khan with all this energy, all this character. She was the flashpoint, she was the center, she was just it on that stage. With Shaka on board, Rufus were soon in the charts. 
but they were being billed as Rufus featuring Shaka Khan. It was inevitable she'd be offered a solo contract. She knew the importance and the value to her career of an anthem of a defining song. With a little help from 14-year-old Whitney Houston on backing vocals, her first solo hit in 78 became a disco anthem. Well, actually, the song kind of wrote itself, and then we realized it should, it should yeah. be her singing it. <laughs> that dance beat is pretty powerful, and you always need a big voice. I can make the rhyme of confusion in your mind. When we heard her voice on it, we said, yes. Yeah, it's like some things you just know, and it was just very clearly, you know, a hit record. You know, when you hear her sing about a powerful woman, you look at her and go, no, she's talking about what she's living. It's a little bit like Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. It's very liberating for women. Every woman in their life at some point has said, I'm every woman. You look at Shaka Khan, you know this is a woman who calls her own shots. This is a woman who doesn't do anything that she doesn't think is right. So when she sings these songs, you believe it. Anything you want done, baby. She's like a vocal acrobat. She can do so many things. I'm Every Woman established Shaka as a disco diva. But there was one slight problem. The band, Rufus, still had a contractual commitment to the record company, so they had to fulfill that. But at the same time, um, she was going to go off and do her solo thing. So there was a certain amount of music industry politics involved. Despite a huge bust-up, Shaka had to agree to do one more album with Rufus. Not in the studio, but live on stage. It was still a dynamic record and then produced, yes, that most enduring of their hits from that period, Ain't Nobody. But within months, her solo career was back on track with another number one hit. But behind the scenes, Shaka was struggling. Shaka had a bad drug problem that dogged her over a couple of decades. It distracted her from her, from her artistry, and she could have done so much more with her life and career. If she managed to keep her personal life together, she should have been the sort of inheritor successor of uh, Aretha Franklin. Feel for you. I'm Every Woman remains one of the biggest disco anthems, but Shaka made it so much her own that only another diva like Whitney Houston would ever dare to cover it. And even the most powerful woman in TV wanted it as her song. Oprah called on the telephone. She says, you know, Val, I really could hear that song as my theme song for the Oprah show. I said, you know, Oprah, I could really hear that too. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she went on and made it her theme song for two years, so we were really happy about that. Shaka herself, though, moved on. She's done soul, blues, and jazz keeping her at the top of her game. He kind of moved through disco and kept on going. Even after quote unquote disco had sort of disappeared, she was still a force in black music. She constantly changed her sound, evolved and changed. I consider myself a fusion artist. I love mixing stuff all together. And I just want to enjoy singing. Shaka did disco when disco was hot and when disco was finished, they went on and did whatever else was happening. Shaka Khan, she's still doing her thing now, you know? Disco's been done for a while, but Shaka's not. July 1978. The disco boom is at its peak, but it's now more Saturday Night Fever than I Will Survive. And just when disco was about to die on its arse, an ambitious young Italian-American arrived in New York. Her career would encompass and transcend all the queens who went before her. 
She would become an enduring global superstar who's come back again and again to disco. Who's that girl? Madonna, of course, the queen of reinvention. I came to New York to be a dancer, and I came to New York to dance in a company professionally. She was determined to make an impression. She came in one Saturday with a sweater which was cut way down to the back and held together with a safety pin about a foot wide and off of one shoulder. Now, she was about 16 and a half or 17. And I looked at her back and I thought, that girl will do something someday. In New York, everybody was doing disco, so Madonna had to be different. She was not doing dance music at that time. She was working on other kinds of sounds and, and she was more rock and roll influenced. She said, I have two friends here from Michigan and they're writing some rock songs and I, I'd like to be a rock singer, she said one day, and I thought, fine, you know, it's, I didn't believe one word of this. But a rock and roll rebel wasn't what record companies were looking for. And there were more pressing matters, like paying the bills. I went to an audition for um, a world tour um, for Patrick Hernandez. <gasps> Patrick Hernandez! He was one of the biggest stars of Euro disco. And Madonna applied to be his backing dancer. He was doing a world tour and he was looking for girls to do backup singing and dancing and go around the world. And I, I thought that'd be great. She said, we made the audition and I'm going to Paris next week. And I never saw her after that. They told Madonna at that time that, you know, that what they planned to do was have her be a part of a troupe, of a review, and then pull her out of it and mold her into a Donna Summer type of entertainer. Hmm. Might have to think about this. Anytime anybody's ever wanted to mold Madonna into anything, it's always been unsuccessful. They didn't really know what to do with me, and they were really busy with Patrick, and I just got really impatient, and I came back to New York eventually after being there for six months. But while she'd been away, something had changed. The charts had been flooded with a load of old disco tosh. Enough is enough, is enough. And the great American public could take no more. In 1979, chanting, Disco sucks, fans of old-fashioned rock and roll gathered at Comiskey Baseball Stadium in Chicago and blew up a massive pile of disco records. Disco was officially over, in the mainstream at least. And anything which was out of favor with the mainstream was okay for our rebel princess. It's enough, it's enough. When she came back from France, then she really started dealing seriously in, in dance music and she started making demos and shopping demos of songs that were dance songs. In New York, the underground club scene was still going strong, even though nobody dared to call it disco anymore. People were moving quickly away from that term, disco, to club music, which was a phrase that was being used as a substitute in the camouflage effect. And the music uh, was evolving out of what was traditionally disco into other forms, and that's when you had all those different things going on. And Madonna was part of that. Madonna used to go around giving everybody her tapes. She was trying to get a break. She was the kind of woman at that time who would do anything that she needed to do to make it. But Madonna would make her own decisions about who she wanted to work with. First met Madonna when I was the DJ at the Fun House in New York. And she came in with a record company representative. Full of energy, happy to be in the place. Came, walked right into my DJ booth and stood there and introduced herself. Madonna's first record deal was with the dance label Sire, and her music was aimed directly at the clubbers. She was all ready to go, and there was only one place to launch herself. Studio 54, private party for the 15 years anniversary of Fiorucci. So in this Fiorucci event at studio, Madonna performed one of the first times ever. I actually 
booked Madonna to be the star of the evening and my boss, Fiorucci, didn't want nothing to do with it because she was completely unknown to the public and they wanted um, the Jennifer Beals from Flashdance because Flashdance had just came out. And I said, no, Madonna, Madonna, and they were like... <laughs> huge cake made out in rubber and Donna popped out of the cake and jumped. I can remember her singing at studio like very fabulous. But that night I almost could see a switch because everybody was gagging over her. Grace was there looking at her and everybody was there. Madonna's early hits, like everybody in 1982, surfaced in the dance charts, not the pop charts. She was very clear and wanting to keep a very credible club base, but at the same time have a record that would have pop appeal. So the next step was to cross over into pop. And to do it, she turned back to disco and recruited the man behind classic disco group, Chic. Music was on the cusp of changing from old school to new school. And I'm, I was still part of the old school. Madonna was much more new school and going to the techno-based dance music. By the time Holiday came along in 1984, disco had been out of favor for four years. And the music had been a bit, well, boring. When Madonna arrived, people could dance and party again. Madonna is the ultimate embodiment of disco. And as she reinvented herself and her music, she's always remained true, keeping her finger firmly on the pulse of clubs, fashions, and sex. And that's why she's still a global superstar. Her instincts for dance music, which are crucial for a pop artist, all come from directed observation of being a club dancer, of knowing DJs, of watching crowds, and the way that you learn from disco. She's one of those artists who never forgot about the audience that got her to where she is. Never forgot. But it's not just Queen Madge who's at it. Disco is still all around us. And it's all thanks to those original Queens of Disco. Disco, the word changes, but the dance still goes on. <laughs> <laughs>